morning. Let me go ahead and uh, give your attention to why we do this. On the night he was betrayed, Jesus broke bread. He gave it to his disciples. Take and eat. This is my body. He took a cup. Drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the covenant. It is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. It matters how we do this. Let each of us look in our lives. Let us recognize our sin. Let us see the grace of God in the body and blood of Christ broken for us poured out for our forgiveness it matters that we do this let us eat the bread drink from the cup remember the Lord's death in our place on the cross looking for his return Good morning and welcome. Thanks so much uh, for joining us this morning. As you can see, we're going to be observing the Lord's Supper together this morning. And um, as we do that, uh, we want to make sure that we have kind of an uninterrupted time of worship this morning. So what I want to do is begin with some of the announcements, with our offerings and things like that, to kind of get those out of the way so that we can just spend some uninterrupted time celebrating what Jesus has done for us. Uh, if you'd like to get a hold of us, if you need to contact us for any reason, the information is up on the screen right now. We are here for you. We would love to serve you. We would love to help you in your walk with Jesus in any way that we can. So we invite you to, uh, to go ahead and contact us. Next week, we're going to be starting a, a new sermon series. I'm really looking forward to this. It's called Living in Light of Eternity. And we're going to be studying the book of 1 Thessalonians. And it's a great book because... The people of that time were waiting for Jesus and wondering why he hadn't come. And uh, Paul writes this letter to the church to say, here's how you ought to live as you await the coming of Jesus. So we'll be spending some time doing that for the next several weeks. You'll want to be a part of that. Finally, before we get started, uh, if you'd like to give an offering today, there are several ways you can do that. If you're here with us in person, there are boxes at the back and in the lobby. If you're joining us online, you can text to give. You can go to our website and, uh, and give there. That's one way that you can express your appreciation to Jesus for what he's done for you as we uh, do that this morning. So I want to begin by just giving you a few instructions about uh, what we're going to do here this morning so you can kind of know where we're going. Um, let me just first say this, if you are a disciple of Jesus, if you have committed your life to him, then we invite you to participate in everything that we'll do this morning. Doesn't matter whether you're part of this church because you are part of the church of the body of Christ. And so as we take the bread and as we take the cup a little later on, we invite you to be a part of that. If you have never committed your life to Jesus, then we just want to lovingly say to you, we ask that you wouldn't participate in the bread and the cup. We, we pray that what we do here this morning will be a great testimony to you about what Jesus has done and that you will commit your life to him. But the Bible's really clear that if we take of the bread and the cup in an unworthy manner, that, that there are some serious consequences to that. If you're joining us online at home, we, uh, we suggest right now that you would get some kind of bread that you can use this morning some kind of beverage if you happen to have grape juice that would be great it's probably the best but if not any other beverage will do any kind of bread or crackers will do um, these are just elements that represent the body and blood of christ and so anything that would remind you that would be great hopefully if you're here with us in person you got one of these little uh, cups like this when you came in just so you know real quick, there's actually two different um, covers on here. The top one, when we get ready to do the bread, will come off and the little wafer will come out. And then if the next one will open up the juice at the appropriate time. Um, 
It's like those little ketchup packets and stuff. You need to be careful or you'll have juice all over you probably. <laughs> so you want to be careful with those um, when you do that. Um, but we invite you to just really to enjoy this time. But as we begin, the scriptures are really clear that that we need to do this in a worthy manner. And so Paul, as he writes to the church in Corinth, he gives them some instructions about how to celebrate the Lord's Supper together. And so what I want to ask you to do is to read together with me from 1 Corinthians these verses where he talks about examining ourselves. So if you go ahead and read those with me, think about them and what they mean. Let's read together. Whoever therefore eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty concerning the body and blood of the Lord. Let a person examine himself then, and so eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body eats and drinks judgment on himself. And so as we sing this first song this morning, it's a song that's called Make Room. It's a new song. We invite you to go ahead and just to take some time to think about that. To think about maybe any sin in your life that you haven't confessed to God. To make sure that as you gather this morning, you really are recognizing the body and the blood of Jesus. This is a beautiful song about making sure that we just give our entire lives over to Jesus. And so it's an appropriate one for us to begin with this morning. So would you go ahead and stand with us as we sing?
what we know of the Lord's Supper uh, primarily comes to us through the gospel accounts, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and from what Paul writes in 1 Corinthians chapter 11. And uh, if you've ever looked at the gospel accounts, you will recognize that what Jesus, or what John writes in his gospel account is a little bit different than the other accounts. The other accounts kind of focus on the, the mechanics of the Lord's Supper, about what Jesus does with the bread and what he does with the cup, and, and John doesn't include any of that. And you might be asking, well, why is that the case? And that's a really good question for us to ask. And I think a lot of it goes back to the fact that we know that each one of the gospel writers, they wrote their gospel account. They're different authors, first of all, so they had their own personality that's in there. They're written at different times. They're written to different audiences, and they're written from different perspectives. And uh, probably the Gospel of John is probably the last one that's written out of all the gospels. Probably Mark is written first. And then uh, Matthew and Luke follow, and then John, maybe as late as uh, 100 A.D., which is about 70, 65, 70 years after the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And so John is writing from a little different perspective than the other gospel writers. And we talked a lot about this, didn't we, in our, our last sermon series in the Seven Signs. We talked about why John writes his gospel. Anyone remember, what, what was the purpose of John writing his gospel? Yeah, that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ. He's the Son of God. Here's what he writes at the end of John chapter 20. Now, Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing, you may have life in his name. And so he, he writes from that perspective. That's why he's writing his gospel. And so he doesn't focus so much on, on the mechanics, as I say, what hap happens there. But what John focuses on is the conversation that takes place between Jesus and his disciples, both during the meal and in the time between the meal ends and when Jesus goes to the cross very shortly thereafter. They're gathered in the upper room. They're celebrating the Passover service or Passover uh, dinner meal. And Jesus begins to talk to his disciples. Now, in John chapter 13, John begins with the description of how Jesus comes in and he washes the disciples' feet. And then he goes on to tell us a little bit more about the betrayal of Judas, some things that we don't see in the other gospel accounts quite so much. And then, starting in chapter 14, there's this discourse that goes all the way through John chapter 17. And in there, Jesus really is going to do three things in that time that he speaks to the disciples. Now, you have to remember that, that he's about to go to the Father, and so the first thing he wants to do, he wants to reassure him that he's coming back again. So at the beginning of, of, of John chapter 14, he talks to them about the fact that he's going to prepare a place for them and that he will come back to them again. The second thing he does here is he tells them, look, you're going to have to live your life here. You're going to carry out this mission that I've given to you, but I'm not leaving you alone. I'm going to leave you with the Holy Spirit who will dwell permanently in your life. And he does that to encourage them because he's no longer going to be physically present with them. And then the last thing he does, and this is amazing, is that he prays for them in John chapter 17. And as we look at the, the Lord's Supper this morning, we're going to kind of focus on at least a portion of those chapters. And the reason I want to do that this morning is because I think Jesus wants to also reassure us. We live in a time, kind of like the time where John is writing his gospel, where Jesus hasn't come back yet. And we want to be reminded of the fact that Jesus hasn't forgotten us. Yes, as we take the cup and the bread, we look back to the death and resurrection of Jesus. But we also want to look forward to the present and how Jesus equips us to live our lives right here and now. And so this morning, we're going to be looking at, uh, at several different parts of, of, this path, of this section between John 13 and 17. And we're going to discover together how that can encourage us. And it's my prayer that it would encourage you. One of the things we know about the, the Lord's Supper that Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians is that when we take the cup, when we take the bread, that we're proclaiming the Lord's death until he comes again. Here's what he writes in, in verse 
26, for as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. And today we want to focus on that part of it. And we want to be encouraged by these passages of scripture that we're going to look at together this morning. Some of that will be some scripture that's read. Some of it will be um, some videos that explain the, the scriptures. And so I'd encourage you, if you want to follow along, you can open up your Bibles to John chapter 14. This, the verses will be up on the screen too, so you don't have to do that. But if you'd like to follow along, you can do that in your Bibles. And so this morning, we're going to kind of take that and mix some songs in between there. And just, I want you to be encouraged this morning by the words of Jesus. So Gerald's going to begin by reading for us from John chapter 14. John chapter 14, verses 1 to 14. Let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself. That where I am, you may also, you may be also. And you know the way to where I am going. Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you are going. How can we know the way? Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you had known me, you would have known my Father also. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. Philip said to him, Lord, show us the Father, and it is enough for us. Jesus said to him, Have I been with you so long, and you still do not know me, Philip? Whoever has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Do you not believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? The words that I say to you, I do not speak on my own authority, but the Father who dwells in me does his works. Believe me that I am in the Father and the Father is in me, or else believe on account of the works themselves. Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever believes in me will also do the works that I do, and greater works than these will he do, because I am going to the Father. Whatever you ask in my name, this I will do, that, my, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask me anything in my name, I will do it. Would you stand with us as we sing about the name of Jesus?
It is the name of Jesus that guarantees that He will return one day. And that He'll take us to a place where we will physically live in His presence for eternity. That night when Jesus took the bread and He said, This is my body given for you, the the bread represented not just His physical body, but the life that He lived here on earth as a human being. And at least part of the importance of that is the fact that one day that we will get to spend eternity with Jesus in a place where we will physically live in his presence. And so this morning as we take the bread, I pray that it will be an encouragement to you to remember that. To remember that there is power in the name of Jesus and that that guarantees that one day we will live in his presence forever. So if you go ahead and take your bread... The Bible tells us that night as they ate the Passover meal together that Jesus took the bread, which was part of the Passover meal, but he gave it new meaning. He said, this is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. As Jesus continued that night, he continued to tell the disciples about the Holy Spirit, who he would send to live in them. And as this video shows us, that was to be an encouragement to them, that they would have the power to do what Jesus was asking them to do. Throughout the Gospels, we read that Jesus was empowered by the Holy Spirit. What does this mean? Well, Scripture teaches that the Holy Spirit is an indispensable part of God and that God is manifested in three persons. God the Father, Jesus Christ, and the Holy Spirit. This is also referred to as the Holy Trinity. According to the Gospel narrative, it was the Holy Spirit that caused Jesus to be conceived by Mary in Nazareth. It was the Holy Spirit that qualified Jesus for ministry during his baptism by John in the Jordan River. It was the wisdom of the Holy Spirit that allowed Jesus to teach with authority throughout the region of Galilee and in the temple at Jerusalem. And it was the power of the Holy Spirit that enabled Jesus to do miracles such as raising his friend Lazarus from the dead at Bethany. Now, at the Last Supper with his closest followers, he tells them, If you love me, you will keep my commandments. And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper to be with you forever, even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him. You know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. John 14, 15 through 16. These things I have spoken to you while I am still with you. But the helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, He will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I have said to you. John 14, 25 through 26. This is an amazing and mysterious promise. In the upper room, Jesus declares that the same Holy Spirit that empowered his work throughout his ministry will soon be available to his apostles. The Holy Spirit would act as their helper throughout their lives and mission that comes next. Indeed, the New Testament book, The Acts of the Apostles, shows that these men became completely changed, full of confidence and courage. In John chapter 16, Jesus went on to explain more about the coming of the Holy Spirit. But I have said these things to you, that when their hour comes, you may remember that I told them to you. I did not say these things to you from the beginning, because I was with you. But now I am going to him who sent me, and none of you asks me, where are you going? But because I have said these things to you, sorrow has filled your heart. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away, for if I do not go away, the helper will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. And when he comes, he will convict the world concerning sin and righteousness and judgment. Concerning sin, 
because they do not believe in me. Concerning righteousness, because I go to the Father and you will see me no longer. Concerning judgment, because the ruler of this world is judged. I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. When the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all the truth, for he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak, and he will declare to you the things that are to come. He will glorify me, for he will take what is mine and declare it to you. And that the Father, all that the Father has is mine, therefore I said that he will take what is mine and declare it to you. As we get ready to uh, prepare to take the cup, would you stand with us as we sing Old the Blood? Oh, the 
this morning. I pray that it will remind you of the fact that the Holy Spirit is living in those who belong to Jesus Christ. That he dwells permanently within us to remind us that he has given us the power to live our lives daily in a way that would bring glory and honor to him. That's why he died on the cross for us. That's why he shed his blood. Not only so that we could live for eternity, but so that we could have eternal life right here and now. As we've talked about before, eternal life is not just a quantity of time, it's a quality of time. And that quality is made possible by the Holy Spirit. So the Bible tells us that on that night, that he took the cup. It was the cup of redemption, the third cup that they drank during the uh, Passover supper. And he gave it a new meaning. He said, this cup represents my blood, which is shed for you. Do this in remembrance of me. That night, as Jesus continued to speak to to the disciples, he went on to encourage them that even though they would face trials in this world, that he would be with them. And as you listen to these words from John chapter 16, I pray that they would encourage you this morning. I have said these things to you in figures of speech. The hour is coming when I will no longer speak to you in figures of speech, but will tell you plainly about the Father. In that day you will ask in my name, and I do not say to you that I will ask the Father on your behalf. For the Father himself loves you, because you have loved me and have believed that I came from God. I came from the Father and have come into the world, and now I am leaving the world and going to the Father. His disciples said, Ah, now you are speaking plainly and not using figurative speech. Now we know that you know all things and do not need anyone to question you. This is why we believe that you came from God. Jesus answered them, Do you now believe? Behold, the hour is coming. Indeed, it has come when you will be scattered, each to his own home, and will leave me alone. Yet I am not alone, for the Father is with me. I have said these things to you, that in my name you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation, but take heart, I have overcome the world. As we close our time this morning, we're going to end with the song, Here's My Heart. This is really a prayer to God to say, Jesus, I love you. Thank you for what you've done for me. Thank you for shedding your blood on the cross for me. And as a result of that, God, I want to give you my heart. So as we sing this together, would you make this your prayer to God? Go ahead and stand with us as we sing.
Promise to go and prepare a place for us, a place where we will live for eternity. Knowing that your Holy Spirit lives permanently in our lives, that same Spirit who raised Jesus from the dead is at work in our lives. And so I pray that as we leave this place today, that you would empower us to live lives of confidence. Confidence not in us, but confidence in you. And as a result, we would live our lives in a way that would bring glory and honor to you and to your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, whose name in which we pray. And all God's people said, Amen.